Entonces, eh, necesitamos eh, que eh, esperen eh, para poder hacer las preguntas. Eh, vamos a partir una media hora eh, donde estaremos haciendo preguntas predeterminadas que tenemos, hemos estado reuniendo mediante Facebook e Instagram. Y posterior a ello, haremos eh, una ronda de preguntas y respuestas. Obviamente, pro, es muy probable que no alcancemos a preguntar todos, así que les pedimos que las escriban por el chat. Ahí estaremos reuniendo las preguntas, ¿vale? Las vamos a reunir por el chat. Así que, sin más preámbulos, los dejo con Víctor y con John Palmer. John, please uh, activate your microphone. Eh, chicos, por favor les vamos a pedir que desconecten a los que faltan eh, las cámaras y los micrófonos para tener un audio lo más limpio posible y disponer del mejor ancho de banda. Eh, John, please, are you available? Okay, I think my microphone's on. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, good. Um, yes, well, wow, what a group. Thank you all for coming today. And, uh... Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, John, I, I want to make an introduction for the Spanish speakers. Uh, okay. So, uh, John Palmer is uh, el autor de How to Brew, uno de los libros más icónicos en lo que es la, la fabricación casera de cerveza. Ya, ya está en el cuarto, en la cuarta edición. Es tremenda, 619 páginas de puro conocimiento. Ya, eh, penosamente... Técnicamente no tenemos la capacidad de hacer una traducción simultánea. Le vamos a pedir a John que hable un poco más lento para los que no puedan entender. Vamos a ver si esto, pues, como la, esto va a quedar grabado, vamos a ver si podemos hacer alguna traducción o similar posterior. Ya, pero en este momento no tenemos la capacidad técnica de hacerla en español. John, please, I'm going to ask you if you can speak a little bit slowly, please, eh, for all the audience. And uh, we want to start, as, as I said to you before, the, um, with the five points of, uh, of priorities for brewing good beer. Okay. If you, want, if you can talk a little bit about uh, each one of them. Okay. Um, well, my, my top five priorities for brewing good beer. Number one is sanitation, because we are trying to Uh, ferment our wort with only the yeast. So if you don't have good ferment, uh, good sanitation, then you will have other uh, microbes in the wort as well. So sanitation is number one. Do you want to do that part and then I'll go on? Eh, bueno, eh, sanitización vendría a ser uno de los puntos más importantes iniciales porque es donde nosotros podemos tener eh, a, nuestra, a, no, a nuestro microorganismo, nuestra levadura, trabajando sola y sin ninguna interferencia de otros microorganismos contaminantes. Ok, number two is good yeast management. Again, we need a good fermentation. So to have a good fermentation, we must have healthy yeast and enough healthy yeast. Ya, para tener una buena fermentación, lo que necesitamos es tener, primero, una levadura saludable, y dos, una cantidad de levadura que sea la adecuada. Ok. Third one is good fermentation temperature control. Because we want, now that we have enough yeast, we want to have the right conditions for the yeast to work. And so, the, the primary control of your yeast is the, the temperature of the fermentation. Eh, y la, bueno, el punto que sigue tiene relación con el control de la fermentación, o sea, no solo tener una levadura eh, la cantidad adecuada y, y saludable, sino controlar las condiciones para tener una fermentación eh, correcta. Ok. Ok. Next, we worry about the boil, because... Beer is two part. You make the wort and then you boil the wort, you cook it with the hops and then you ferment it. So the cooking of the wort is very important for flavor development. 
And you want to, every time you make a particular recipe, um, especially if you're a professional brewer, you want to cook the wort the same way every time because that's where a lot of your flavor development comes from. Ahora sí. El hervor que es tremendamente importante en el desarrollo de sabor, ya en general nosotros queremos que siempre el hervor sea el mismo para que el desarrollo de sabor sea de la misma forma, ya por lo cual también es un punto súper importante eh, de tener un mosto, un, un control en el hervor del mosto adecuado. Ok. And number five is a good recipe. And a good recipe is all about proportions. You want to have uh, balanced proportions of the different ingredients in your malt bill. Your base malt is 80 to 90 percent of your recipe. And then you have specialty malts like, that are 10 percent for the main flavor, such as uh, roast barley in a stout, and then other malts that are like 5 percent by weight, and those are your accent uh, malts. Ya, importante la receta, que sea que haya un buen balance de malta, cerca del 85 al 90% de la receta va a ser una malta base, pero eh, también vamos a tener el, las maltas de especialidad que van a ser este 10-5% que van a, a darle las características a la receta. Eh, one second, uh, John. Eh, chicos, por favor, los que tienen la cámara conectada, desconectenla, ya, y los micrófonos también, y... Como ven, es bastante lento hacer este el tema de la traducción simultánea y yo no soy traductor, lo cual me complica bastante. Y aparte, como soy host, tengo que estar revisando las preguntas. Por lo cual, vamos a seguir simplemente con John hablando. Eh, eh, como les decía, vamos a ver la posibilidad de, de poder, como tenemos vamos a tener esto grabado, quizás hacer una traducción lateral. Eh, pero aquí John ya continúa solo. John, eh, I'm not going to translate eh, because it's too slow. So the idea is that you keep talking, please. Okay. Um, and um, and when we develop the questions, um, I'll let you know the the questions that we get from uh, Instagram and the question that we're getting uh, through the chat. Okay. So uh, right now the first question is, uh, you you can. Um, Talk a little bit more about the the relevance of the temperature control on fermentation. Okay. Temperature control is important to control the activity of the yeast. You want the yeast to start the fermentation at the cool end and work slowly in the beginning because they'll produce less byproducts. And then you want the temperature to rise towards the end of fermentation because that way they'll stay active and they'll be able to maturate the beer better. They'll be able to clean up those byproducts better. So you want to have a consistent temperature, but also if that temperature can rise towards the end of fermentation, it's, it's good. Perfect. Uh, in, in the gist management, okay, if you can uh, talk a little bit more about that, please. Okay, yeast management is all about having an, a sufficient amount of clean, healthy yeast. So we're talking about pitching rates, having a pitching a sufficient amount of yeast, um, and in how to brew. Um, there in the chapter on pitching rates, there's a lot of information. Um, other books, other websites talk about pitching rates as well. And it's all about having enough yeast to ferment your beer. Perfect. Let me see. Um, what changes do you expect to happen uh, in the uh, maturation and what's the difference between a uh, made it in cool or uh, room temperature and what temperature uh, you recommend to okay. moderate? 
Okay, so let's say you're doing an ale at um, at 15 degrees Celsius. Um, so you start out fermenting at 15 degrees. Let me see what this is. Oops, 59, that's too cold. That's all right. Okay, so 15 degrees, that's a little bit cool for most ale yeasts. Um, but you, if you start there, they will slowly increase their activity as they get going. And they will produce, they'll be less active in producing less byproducts. They'll be fermenting slowly. Now, as the yeast, the amount of yeast grows, um, then they will start fermenting faster and they'll produce more byproducts but at the same time, there'll be more yeast available to clean up those byproducts. What you want to do when you ferment is you want to pitch enough yeast at the beginning of fermentation so that the yeast only go through one or two uh, growth cycles producing daughter cells. The only one, if you want to produce one or two daughter cells in the time it takes for them to eat up all the sugar because uh, that way they'll run out of sugar but they'll still be hungry and now they'll turn to these byproducts the acetaldehyde the diacetyl and they'll clean up those byproducts because they're still hungry so it's a it's about pitching enough yeast to the fermentation and controlling the temperature to control the amount of byproducts so that uh, at the end, when the sugar runs out, you still have lots of hungry yeast ready to clean up those byproducts and maturate the beer. Perfect. <clears throat> In your book, you talk about the, the three phases of fermentation. Adaptation, exponential growth, and maturation. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the each phase? Yeah, activation, uh, the the acclimation, the the lag phase. Um, that's when the yeast are physically growing. You know, when you first pitch them to the wort, um, the yeast have not eaten in a while. They've been, you know. You know, maybe they came from a starter, maybe they just came from a, a package. Um, they need to take in nutrients. They need to uh, grow, physically grow in size. And this picture in How to Brew describes this. I don't know how well you can see it. But it's on page 89. And so the, the, yeast, the yeast cell grows and it takes in nutrients. Um, and when it has taken in enough nutrients, then it can start to grow, start to produce daughter cells. And that's, that's the exponential growth phase. Once they've gone through the adaptation in physical growth, now they can move on to reproduction. And this is exponential growth. They'll they will produce daughter cells for as long as they have sufficient nutrient reserves that they took in at the beginning of fermentation. Once they've used those up, they can't produce any more daughter cells. And now you're going into the maturation phase. The, the growth is mostly over and now the yeast is looking ahead and saying, uh, you know, the sugar's gone. What else can I eat? I'm going to eat these byproducts. Hang on a second. Um, so the, uh, let's see, where is I? So you, Adaptation is, is the beginning uh, before they start reproduction. Then the exponential growth is the reproduction. After that is 
you know, the sugar has gone, they've eaten that, and now they're cleaning up byproducts. When uh, they've consumed that, then they that's when they flocculate and settle out and live off of the um, their glycogen reserves and so on until the next fermentation. Yeah, perfect. Um, let me check. I hope that was clear. Yeah, a lot. Uh, we have a related question. For example, in, in relation to the fermentation temperature, there is a difference between controlling the uh, the word the word uh, temperature or controlling the room temperature. Uh, do you know anything about that? Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on this the size of your fermenter, how much wort you're making. Um, so it's it's good if you can control the the beer temperature you know if you have like a jacketed fermenter that you can actively control um because that allows you better uh, c uh better control of the actual temperature but most people don't have that most of you have a fermenter sitting in a room or inside of a refrigerator uh that you're controlling the temperature of the air around the fermentation and for small volumes, you know, uh, 20 liters, 50 liters, 100 liters, uh, controlling the room temperature is sufficient um, because, you know, the, the, the wort will be warmer than the room temperature, but, but not much um, because of this difference in sizes. But when you start getting up to, you know, a 10 barrel fermenter, you know, 300 liters um, or, um, or 3,000 liters, uh, now you need to control the, the fermenter temperature better and you're going to be controlling the, the uh, wort temperature. But in, and for a lot of people, um, it's hard to raise the temperature of the fermentation uh, as the ferment is. And um, for the, at the home brewing level, uh, that can be easy because all you do is let the room warm up or let the refrigerator warm up. Um, but in other countries, especially way up north, like in Norway, uh, where it's cold, or maybe, you know, conversely down in Chile where it's cold, um, you may have to add a heater to the room to help that fermentation uh, stay warm uh, towards the end of the fermentation cycle. Awesome. Uh, there are people asking about uh, open fermentation, the difference between, uh, and if you can do it, and the difference between made it open or closed, and if you have some recommendation for that. Okay. Open fermentation has the advantage that you don't have to aerate your wort as much. Um, and you, and you don't, don't have to be as picky about um, your, your pitching rates because with an open fermentation, the yeast have access to room oxygen. Um, they can reproduce more easily and they're able to grow more. So you can get with open fermentation, fermentation, you can pitch a smaller pitching rate and get lots of yeast growth and a good fermentation. With closed fermentation, which is what we've been doing as home brewers for a long time, um, you have to be more considerate of your pitching rate to make sure you have enough yeast and you have to aerate your wort well because once you've put the airlock in, that's all the yeast get. They don't get any more oxygen. They've got to make do with what you've given them. So open fermentation is, is uh, a good method. Um, a lot of people are concerned about uh, contamination with open fermentation, but a good healthy open fermentation builds up a very thick yeast mass 
on top of the fermenter and nothing's getting in. There's lots of CO2 coming off. I mean, flies can't fly over it. Uh, they die. And if they do die and fall on it, they'll be carried out to the edge. I've seen it happen. So um, an open fermentation really manages itself. Now, as the fermentation winds down and that foam starts to fall, uh, now you're going to want to uh, rack the beer away to another uh, fermenter, a closed fermenter for maturation um, because as, as that yeast mass settles down and the fermentation slows down. And this is why we used to talk about primary fermentation and secondary fermentation. And that's re with regard to open fermentation. The open fermentation was the primary. And then after that, you racked to another uh, maturation vessel. Um, and that was your secondary fermentation. With closed fermentation, we combine both of those steps into one. Oops, I can't hear you. Perfect, right now. Uh, we had a lot of questions here. Um, so let me check uh, which ones are related to the subject. Uh, for example, uh, there, there are ones about uh, the pitching rate. Uh, see if you can check a little bit about, about that. And uh, how to measure or uh, incorporate oxygen in the, okay. in the world. Okay. Pitching rate um, for ale fermentations, you want about um, 0.75 billion per liter per degree Plato. You know, and a, a degree Plato is about four gravity points. Four, yeah, four. Um, you want about... Uh, 0.75 billion cells per liter per degree Plato. That's your pitching rate for ales. For lagers, you want about twice that, one and a half billion per liter per degree Plato of your wort. So if you've got a 10 Plato wort or 1.040 gravity, that's 10 Plato, um, and you had 20 liters of that, that's 20 times 10, 200 times 0.75. That's your pitching rate in billions of yeast cells. And most yeast packages are around 100 billion cells per package. White Labs, Y Yeast, um, Omega Yeast, some of the other companies, um, the dry yeast packets. Um, around 100, 100 billion cells as well. It's, it's hard to over pitch. So don't worry about, you know, if you're adding too much yeast. Um, adding more yeast is really not a problem. It's when you under pitch that you run into problems with your fermentation. Now, the second question was about oxygenation or aeration, how much oxygen do yeast need? Well, at sea level, um, the saturation for oxygen in the wort is somewhere between eight and 10 parts per million. As you go higher in elevation, that number decreases and it can be harder to get enough oxygen in the wort. So, um, if you're at high elevations or if you have a very strong wort, uh, the high gravity wort, that also decreases the amount of oxygen you can get in. Then you may want to oxygenate with pure oxygen rather than air. And that will allow you to get up to, say, 20 parts per million um, in, in the wort. So pure oxygen is more effective than just room air, but you can do too much oxygen if you go, if you add oxygen for more than say a minute or two minutes at a time, 
you can put in too much oxygen and you can end up uh, producing very fusel uh, alcohol, very solventy uh, flavors in your beer. So don't be aware of that. If you add too much oxygen to your wort, you're going to get solvent flavors. Perfect. Uh, here we have, uh, for example, can you talk about a pressurized fermentation and uh, if you had any tip to estimating pitching rate using sludge? Ah, uh, pressurized fermentation I have not done. Um, it, I don't, I don't think pressurized fermentation is a technique that home brewers need to use. Um, it's a it's a problem that professional brewers run into that with because of their high, you know, their very large tanks, um, they get uh, um, a lot of yeast stress and they can reduce their esters by uh, uh, fermenting under pressure. Um, and that's not a problem we have at our scale. So I, I haven't done it myself. Um, the second part of the question was what? Um, about the uh, estimated pitching rate uh, using the sludge. Oh, yes. Um, gosh. I don't remember what I said about that. I'm looking in the book. I think I talked about it. Um, I don't remember where that is. I think... Yeah, I, I'm not sure what to tell you there. I think Looking how to brew, I may have talked about it in there in the new edition. Um, otherwise, you would have to uh, use actual yeast counting techniques. Um, take a sample of the of the sludge or the slurry, dilute it with some water, and then do a yeast count on the hemocytometer and grid and count your yeast to know what your pitching rate is. Perfect. But again, it's hard to over pitch. So, you know, if you add, you know, more, you know, a lot of yeast, that's okay. What you don't want to do is you you don't want to add a lot of old dead yeast to your fermenter. You don't want to, you know, if you're firm, if you've got your new wort ready to ferment, you don't want to take an old fermentation and dump everything in there. All the old yeast cake because all those old dead cells are going to produce, you know, that yeast autolysis flavor, that rubbery or meaty ham-like flavor in your beer. You don't want to pitch dead yeast. You want to pitch healthy, fresh yeast. Yeah, we have a few questions here. Uh, for example, the dry yeast versus liquid yeast, uh, talking about sludge, and uh, um, to reuse yeast. Is the count cell, uh, the cell count essential to do it? It's not essential. Um, I don't know how to tell you to estimate it. Um, 250 milliliters of yeast slurry is good for a, a five-gallon batch. 250 milliliters of, of sludge is good for 20 liters, even up to 50 liters. Um, and you could go to 500 milliliters uh, for that same amount. It would be okay. What you don't want to do is under pitch. You only, you know, if you only have, you know, 50 milliliters or 100 milliliters of yeast to 20 liters or more, that's when you have a problem. So um, now with yeast packets, dry yeast, you're looking at at least 100 billion cells, maybe 150 billion cells in one yeast packet. 
And so uh, going through the calculation, you know, 0.75 per liter per degree Plato, um, one yeast packet will ferment 20 liters of 1040 uh, or 10 Plato wort. Um, and it will probably even do 20 liters of 1060. But as you go to larger volumes and higher gravities, you may want to use two yeast packets to be sure. And that won't hurt anything. Um, it's, you know, always pitch more yeast than you need and you'll be fine. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, here they ask um, uh, <clears throat> about the, the, the recommendation of it, it, um, put water on the yeast, uh, the dry yeast, on the need of oxygen of the dry yeast. Uh, what do you think about that? Okay. Um, this is fairly new. The yeast companies have been getting better and better over the last 10 years in packaging their yeast, in growing the yeast and getting them very healthy and then drying them carefully and packaging them. So uh, they are saying now that uh, when you can, you can pour the, the yeast directly onto your wort, you don't have to rehydrate. The um, they've done. I've seen the the study where they compared, you know, pitching yeast onto distilled water, onto tap water, onto uh, a ten forty wort, and onto a ten one hundred wort, and only the ten one hundred wort was a problem. Um, in that, they only had like eighty percent viability hydrating onto a very high strength wort. Everything else was about the same at around 95% viability. So you can, you don't have to rehydrate. You can just, you can pour the yeast directly onto most worts. It'll work. Now, when it comes to oxygen, dry yeast have been grown and with lots of lipids and lots of nutrients that they would normally get uh, from your wort and from the oxygen that you've aerated with. So if you're, if you're brewing with a fresh package of dry yeast from Fermentus or Lalamond, they have done that adaptation phase for you. They've done the aeration. They've done the nutrients in the yeast for you. And so you can just pitch that yeast directly to the wort and it should have sufficient nutrients to have a good fermentation. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that a little extra oxygen won't hurt. Or, and you, you, can, you can add more oxygen and it'll be fine. Um, you, can, you can rehydrate them first and that'll be fine. Um, Today's dry yeast is very robust, um, but that's only these dry yeasts. If you're um, brewing with a liquid yeast packet, you probably need to create a starter and make sure that that yeast is uh, healthy and has all the nutrients it needs uh, for a good fermentation. You know, it may have been a month or so be between and when it was uh, manufactured and grown vert to when you received it. Awesome. Uh, here, um, any suggestion in how to achieve uh, the temperature control with affordable affordable tools uh, in the home brewing? The best way to achieve temperature control in home brewing is to get a spare refrigerator um, and uh, and a small heater. Uh, like a little electric heater. And you can put, you can get a two-stage temperature controller, one that controls the hot side, one controls the cold side. And um, that two-stage temperature controller will turn on the refrigerator when it gets too warm, and it'll turn on the heater when it gets too cold. 
Um, that's, you can do it with, you know, an insulated box and ice packs. Um, you can do it with, you know, a water bath, but the best way, the, the, at the end of the day, the best way to do it is to get a spare refrigerator. Perfect. <clears throat> they asking here about the for for one one point uh, they asking for different kind of yeast. For example, Brennanomyces, uh, Kvike. Uh, if you can talk a little bit about them and if uh, you can use it in home brewing. Oh yes, um, the uh, Brettanomyces is you know, the, the funky yeast, it produces more phenols, um, has some of that barnyard character to it. Um, it's a very high attenuating yeast usually. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a fan of Belgian beers, uh, Saison uh, styles, um, some sour styles, uh, you know, they will, they use the Britannomyces yeast uh, as part of their character. Um, Britannomyces is a very robust yeast. Um, you have to be careful that you don't um, contaminate your other brews with it because it survives very well. It survives um, if you don't clean your equipment thoroughly, it will survive and um, it will contaminate the that you make. So all of your beers will eventually be Britannomyces beers. That's something to keep in mind. The uh, Krike yeasts from Norway, um, these are very nice yeasts. I've, I've had a lot of, of Krike beers made with them. Um, they're very good tasting. Um, and the nice thing about the Oz yeast is that they are less sensitive to temperature. Um, they prefer warm temperatures, body temperatures for fermentation. And so, um, whereas, whereas with most ale and lager yeast, you have to control the fermentation temperature, keep it within a narrow range to keep the beer flavor consistent. With the Krike yeasts, um, you can have that temperature anywhere from 25, 35, even 40 degrees C, and you'll still get a clean beer from it. Uh, and that's a very nice feature to have. So if you don't have a spare refrigerator, or you don't have a good way to keep your fermentation temperature controlled at home, um, try the kike yeasts and just ferment them at room temperature. Um, you'll need to increase the pitching rate at you know, cooler temperatures. Um, but you will still get a very clean beer, uh, very good tasting beer. Perfect. Let me check. We have a question here about the cooling rate. Okay. Uh, if you recommend it to cool it uh, as quickly as possible, or uh, if you recommend some uh, rate of a uh, decreasing temperature? I, I, I don't recommend cooling quickly. Um, every time you cool quickly, you know, like you try to take it from fermentation down to um, serving temperature overnight, you shock the yeast and they excrete uh, lipids that can affect your mm. beer flavor. So uh, cool like one degree per hour or something like that. Uh, cool slowly, you know, um, don't shock your yeast. Perfect. Uh, another question here. Is really necessarily a, a second ox oxygenation for, for high gravity beers uh, 12 hours uh, after yeast inoculation? It's a good idea. Um, you are, you know, as a brewer, you are trying to manage your fermentation. You're trying to, and you're managing your yeast. So, you know, look at, look at your, where you live, your, con, in your conditions. Are you at high altitude? 
do you have trouble getting air into the wort because of your altitude? Um, if so, then a second oxygenation, you know, after six, eight hours into the fermentation may be a good idea. It'll give the yeast more time to absorb the oxygen that they need to, to grow well. Um, you know, if, uh, if you're brewing a high gravity beer and you're using um, like three packets of dry yeast, um, that yeast may have all the nutrients it needs for a good fermentation. You may not have to worry about aerating twice. And if you did aerate twice for that particular wort with those three yeast packets, maybe that's too much oxygen and maybe you would get those solvent flavors. I don't know. I'm just, you, these are the things you have to think about and, and consider when you're planning your fermentation. Perfect. Uh, how to brew with more uh, than two types of uh, microorganisms? Uh, For example, a blend of uh, yeast or uh, using bacteria and yeast. Okay. Um, well, kettle sours, the way you handle that, you, you acidify with the bacteria first and then pitch your yeast second. Okay, that's one way of doing it. Um, you're, you, what you're doing is you're lowering the, B, the work pH from um, 4.8 4 down to 3.8. And once you've done that, then you pitch your yeast and ferment your beer. Um, another way to do it is to pitch your yeast first, ferment the beer out, and then pitch bacteria afterwards and allow those bacteria, you know, several months to acidify the beer and turn it sour. Um, that's the traditional way to do it. So um, that's yeast and bacteria. If you have uh, a mixed culture of yeast and Britannomyces, um, often you can do those concurrently. You can do them at the same time. Um, you know, just be aware that, uh, look at the manufacturer's description of the Britannomyces um, and how it ferments. It may uh, really dry out the beer more so than you want. And be aware of that. Um, I don't know that, well, the crike yeasts, um, sometimes those are mixed cultures. You'll have two or three different kike strains. Um, they also have some bacterial contamination sometimes and have a mixed, you know, crike yeast and bacteria fermentation. Um, I haven't tried many of those beers, um, but those behave the same way, you know, with as regular uh, Saccharomyces. Just the difference is your temperature, your preferred fermentation temperature. Perfect. <clears throat> we have here a question with drags. Any tips to uh, use these uh, drags uh, from uh, mixed fermentation? Ah, drags from mixed fermentation. Yes. Okay. Um, the thing about using the drags from, say, a bottle of, of a Belgian beer is that um, you often have different proportions uh, in the bottle than you do than you did in the original fermentation. So it's hard to say, you know, what exactly ends up in the bottom of the bottle. Uh, maybe you'll have more Britannomyces character left in the bottle than you know the original Saccharomyces, and that can change the flavor if you just pitch from that. Um, generally pitching from the dregs um, you're like one you're getting a different proportion two those bacteria those microbes are not very healthy from the bottom of the bottle so you're going to have to grow them up and you're going to have to feed them and you could end up 
you know, with a culture that is 90% or 95% Britannomyces and only 5% Saccharomyces, when the original fermentation that produced that beer was the exact opposite. So um, it's hard to say. I mean, there's so many factors that affect, you know, the growth and the survivability of those microbes. It's hard to predict what you're going to get from the Dregsville bottle. Yeah, some people here um, <clears throat> ask about the recollection of yeast, used yeast, how uh, how long that that it lasts, and uh, and what temperature do you have to keep it? Okay, um, for most Saccharomyces yeasts, um, you want to collect it and wash it with with water. Um, get the dead yeast out. And you know the the process the procedure for that is in how to brew, um, you know swirl it up, pour off the dead, dead yeast. You should have a nice clean white or ivory looking layer of yeast, and that's what you want to store. You want to uh, store that at in cool temperatures in the refrigerator in an airtight container. Um, You can take uh, boiled water and, and fill up the jar so there's no air. And that will that'll keep for uh, easily a couple of weeks, maybe a month. But because those yeasts are hibernating, if they get exposed to oxygen, um, they're going to try to try to respire that oxygen they're trying, and they're going to use up their their uh, energy reserves. So as you see that the, the yeast culture changing color from white to ivory to brown, they're getting older. Those yeast are dying off. So don't pitch brown yeast. <laughs> pitch, pitch white yeast. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, two questions about high gravity beers. One is how to avoid a uh, fusels and alcoholic aroma in uh, beers like barley wine and Perry stout. And uh, another one is how to incorporate the second yeast batch properly. This Okay, well, the first way to avoid those solventy flavors in a high gravity beer is pitching rate. Uh, my friend Jamil, who we do brew strong together, Um, he makes a triple IPA that is so smooth. It is 13% alcohol, but it only tastes like a 7% alcohol beer. And it's because he pitches a lot of yeast. And those yeasts are never stressed. They, they don't produce the fusel alcohols. It's a very smooth tasting beer. So pitching rate that, you know, 0.75 or 1 one billion cells per liter per degree Plato um, for high gravity beers. That's the key. You got to pitch enough good, healthy yeast. Now, uh, the second part of the question was about uh, aeration again. The second. Uh, the second uh, was the in what uh, what's what are the 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 proper way to incorporate the second uh, batch of yeast in a high gravity beer. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'm thinking back to a presentation I gave uh, in Lima last year um, on high gravity beers. And my friend um, was telling me that in, when he does a Russian Imperial Stout um, and he's got to fill his fermenter over, you know, two batches, you know, two different brews to fill the fermenter. He pitches all of his yeast um, with the first wort and aerates. And then, and then that gets started. And then he... Uh, brews the second batch of wort and adds that 
with air as well. He aerates that second one as well, but he doesn't pitch any more yeast. He just pitches new wort with a, with aerated wort uh, to that uh, fermentary. He puts he puts the total amount of yeast for the combined batch in with the first wort. Perfect. Okay. And uh, they ask about the the recommend the, the if you recommend uh, a specific temperature uh, for fermentation in in high gravity beers. Um, no, I I think it's the same. If you if you are pitching enough healthy yeast, the fermentation temperature should be the same. Perfect. Uh, here is a question from Argentina. Uh, they say they can't get a good Belgian yeast. So, how? What do you recommend if you don't have a a really good uh, Belgian yeast uh, to make, uh, for example, a quad? Or do you have to have a Belgian yeast? Well, if you want that nasty Belgian phenolic <laughs> character. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you know if you get if you get bread yeast from the store, the bread yeast tend to be phenolic positive, and they would that would give you some of that phenol character. Or if you can if you use um, a proportion of say a uh, German Hefeweizen yeast with your ale yeast, your like a cleaner ale yeast, that would give you some of that, you know, uh, phenol character as well. But again, every every yeast strain is different. There, you're not gonna, you know, you, it's hard to come up with a combination of yeasts that will mimic another. Um, if you can't get the Belgian yeast, I think um, it's just not going to taste Belgian. If you want to brew, a, if you want to brew a high alcohol beer like a quad, you know, brew it like a barley wine or brew it as a Russian Imperial Stout. Um, you know, um, you won't have the 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 phenols and some of the the esters uh, from the Belgian yeast, but you can at least have a good clean beer. Perfect. We have some questions about lagers. Okay. See if you have some tips uh, about uh, temperature, time, pressure, and the pitching uh, rate and uh, the pitching temperature okay. on lagers. So many s lagers can be hard for so many people because um, everybody thinks they have to be very cold. And that stresses the yeast. And uh, I used to have very fruity lagers when I was first brewing because I was pitching too cold and not pitching enough yeast. And I would end up with very estery lagers. Um, again, pitching rate is very important. You have to pitch enough yeast. Um, you want to start at the cool end of the fermentation range. And let's say for the lager yeast, I got to do the conversion, the, mat, the temperature conversion here. Um, let's see, 45, ding, ding. Okay, so if you start at like eight degrees Celsius at you, as your fermentation temperature, and as that fermentation progresses, um, you would get up to say 12 Celsius uh, towards the end of fermentation. And again, that, that slight rise in temperature as you know the wort heats up from the yeast activity, um, that it will encourage you know total attenuation. Um, it'll encourage the yeast to keep maturating the beer and cleaning up the diacetyl and acetaldehyde. Um, you can then do a, a further diacetyl rest at the end of fermentation, um, raising that temperature up to 
uh, 15 degrees C, even 18 degrees C uh, for a diacetyl rest. It won't hurt the beer. Um, it's when you it's when you start a lager warm at like 18 degrees C and then try to cool it down for the main fermentation. That's when you run into problems. That's when you run into high acetaldehyde and high esters is because uh, it ferments too fast and it ferments uncontrolled. And then, and then at the end of fermentation, so many people say, okay, you know, it's, it's been seven days, the airlock is slowing down, time to cold crash it. And they chill the beer before the yeast has had time to maturate it. And that's how you got these really bad lagers. So my advice for lagers is start cool, at the cool end of fermentation, not cold, but cool, allow that temperature to rise towards the end of fermentation, do the diacetyl rest, give it a bump in temperature, give it time at that diacetyl rest, three, four days at, at that diacetyl temperature of say 15 to 18 C. Once that's done, now you can start cooling it slowly, don't shock it. Just cool it slowly down to um, 32 or, I mean, sorry, um, you know, near zero, one degree C. And that will help all that yeast and haze to drop and leave you with a clear, clean lager. Sorry. Uh, what about the sulfur production? Sulfur production, um, that's a function of the yeast strain. Um, it's sulfur is evolved from the wort by uh, a vigorous fermentation. Um, lagering times apparently help um, with the yeast to take up that sulfur. I'm not really sure what the mechanism is, um, but many brewers recommend you know, one to two weeks of lagering time, you know, at these cold temperatures to clean up sulfur. It doesn't take, it doesn't take six weeks. It doesn't even take four weeks. Uh, two weeks is usually sufficient. Your mic is off. Yeah, perfect. Uh, they have some questions about uh, using dry hop during fermentation, and uh, if you recommend uh, uh, a single temperature on fermentation or or like a staggering fermentation temperatures. I don't recommend staggering fermentation. Um, what you it depends on your yeast strain one. Uh, you want to control that fermentation and you control the fermentation by controlling temperature. For most people, this means holding that temperature as steady as you can during fermentation. And that's what the big brewers do with their jacketed fermenters. They control the fermentation temperature very steadily. If you look at Belgium and if you look at, you know, Germany uh, before you know, conical fermenters. Uh, they controlled fermentation by controlling the room temperature that the fermenter was in. In fact, if you go to the Heineken brewery in, um, in Chihuahua, um, they, they brew the same way. There are, in the Heineken brewery in Chihuahua, there are, you know, 2,000 or 200 hectoliter fermenters in a temperature controlled room. That's how they ferment Heineken. Um, so, you know, the principle works. If you control, what you're trying to do though is control that fermentation by controlling temperature. Um, I recommend, you know, starting cool, finishing warm. Um, if you can't do that, then just hold it steady if, you, if you, that's easier. Um, Consistency is another aspect of this. And I've forgotten the rest of the question. <laughs> 
<laughs> and um, it was the staggered and the dry hopping in oh, dry um, hopping right um dry hopping well okay for for hazy ipas for hazy uh ipas um you can add hops at different times during fermentation if you add them um at the beginning of fermentation you tend to get better biotransformation of the thiols and geraniol into other compounds more tropical fruit compounds um, the problem is is when you put in hops at the beginning of fermentation um, it clogs up the fermenter it gets it's a lot of mass in the fermenter um, and Jamil, my friend Jamil, recommends that you simply put them in at the end of the whirlpool. Um, and all of those compounds go into the fermenter then um, when you pitch your yeast. But you don't have all this hop mass uh, in your fermenter that makes it hard to repitch or reuse your yeast. So um, dry hopping during fermentation has its benefits in terms of you know beer character and extra extra tropical fruit character but the the hops in in that makes it hard to reuse the yeast so if reusing the yeast is not a problem for you then you know dry hop all you want perfect uh, returning to laggers uh, we had a question here uh, marcelo asked if you cool down after pitching for lagers in, in a few hours, it will help. I couldn't cool it further than uh, 24 degrees and pitches, but he refrigerated uh, six hours to get to 12 degrees. Okay. So it, it, it works? Uh, yeah, don't, don't pitch before you cool. Cool first, then pitch. Okay, so yeah, I have the same problem. When I when I cool my wort, I can only get it down to like, you know, uh, 25 degrees. Um, what I do then, I, I take the fermenter, I put it in the refrigerator, and I cool it down to say 12 uh, Celsius. Then I pitch my yeast the next day. You know, may it takes overnight, but I, 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 you don't want to pitch your yeast and then cool, because that screws up the yeast. <laughs> they, oh. they, they go back into hibernation. They go, you know, why are you chilling me? Don't do that. Cool the wort first, then pitch the yeast to that cool, cool wort, and then start your fermentation. Perfect. Uh, there are a few questions left. Uh, a lot of people asked uh, the the good thing is that we have this uh, uh, this interview recorded to mm -hmm. so they can access uh, uh, the material later uh, but the a lot of questions about the, the reuse you know, of yeast uh, were made so it was really a, a hot topic and um, but I believe that the uh, oh, the last question here is about the use of immobilized yeast and continuous fermentation. Uh, I really don't know anything about that. I mean, I know a little, but very, very little. I, um, I can't really talk about it. Perfect. And some recommendations, for example, if you recommend, uh, I believe, I believe this is a, like a sensitive question, but if you recommend uh, any uh, brand of yeast, um okay i recommend the fermentus 3470 for lagers um that is a very bulletproof yeast i've had lots and lots of beers made with that and it always does very well the the fermentus so5 tends to throw a lot of sulfur and I don't understand why it's doing that. Um, 
it's I think it has something to do with uh, the the malts that we're currently using. Um, maybe their amino acid portfolio in you know in some of the malts in some of the barley varieties that we're using today. The SO5 seems to throw a lot of sulfur. Um, I've had some very sulfury beers that I thought were made with like um, oh, German lager yeast that were actually made with SO5. Um, so I don't really recommend that yeast right now. The, I think the Lollamond um, ESB yeast is a good one. That makes a very clean uh, ale. Um, some of the other Lollamond and Fermentus yeast strains are, are also very good. Um, uh, you know, White Labs, and if you can get White Labs, that's a great, they, a lot of great yeast there. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the South American uh, yeast manufacturers, but uh, I can't. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of good yeast out there. Um, you know. Sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah, right on. And uh, some recommendation about a uh, ale yeast and uh, a recommendation for an American amber ale. American amber ale. Um, the the Chico yeast, the or um, any of the uh, the California ale type yeast work very well. Um, you could also go with some of the um, I forget what they called. Uh, some of the offerings by Omega, um, like East Coast Ale, uh, those are nice. Um, the the East Coast versus West Coast of the United States, the East Coast, you know, type varieties tend to be maltier, and so for an amber ale, they'll throw some more esters um, and <coughs> and some maltier flavors than the drier. West Coast style ale yeasts. Yeah, another question about the ale fermentation. If you recommend it to um, to use it uh, to start uh, low on temperature and then rise, or differently. No, I, I still recommend starting at the cool end. For ale, you'd want to be at, um, hang on. yeah, you, for, for, for ales, you want to start maybe 16 Celsius, 17 Celsius, and finish around 20 Celsius for ales. And the last question, uh, if you can explain a little bit about the metabolic uh, pathway uh, in the produce of uh, esters. Oh, okay. Um, esters are produced um, because the yeast is trying to detoxify itself. It's taking in all these nutrients and some of the, one, one class of nutrient that it takes in are lipids, otherwise known as fatty acids. And it takes in uh, long chain fatty acids and breaks them up into medium chain fatty acids um, that it uses to make things with. And then it has all these short chain fatty acids left over. And it's those short chain fatty acids that are toxic to the yeast cell. And so what it does is it combines those short chain fatty acids with uh, some of these fusel alcohols and creates an ester. And then that ester is not toxic and the ester is excreted out of the yeast cell into the environment where it's not toxic. So yeah, ester formation is a process where the yeast is cleaning up its environment. And so a, a, a fermentation that's stressful on the yeast will produce more esters. Because the, you know, when you put yeast under stress, 
they're not they're not fermenting as well as they would like to. They're creating more of these short chain fatty acids and more byproducts, and they need to esterify them to clean them up. Your mic's off again. We have a question and a request. Okay. The, uh, for example, we have two questions about the, about the, for example, if you don't have any lager option in the market, you, what can you use? And, uh, um, if you recommend a uh, gist for a uh, imperial stout. Okay. Um, so the first question, if you, if you don't have an, a lager yeast available, but you want to make a lager, um, then what I would do is uh, pitch an ale yeast, a very clean tasting ale yeast, like the California ale, um, and uh, ferment it cold um, or cool, so maybe 14 degrees C. Um, but you, you know, because it's so cold, you're going to have to double the pitching rate. So, you know, double the pitching rate of the ale yeast, but ferment it at the very cold end of its temperature range. You know, like you know, 13, 14 degrees Celsius, and that will produce a more lager-like character. Uh, from the ale yeast. Uh, second question was the imperial stout recommendation. Imperial stout. Um, you know, for imperial stout, I don't think you need any special yeast. I think the California ale works quite well. Um, you're getting lots of esters and lots of character just from the high gravity wort. So you don't need a, a special yeast, like a high ester yeast, to give that beer flavor. It's going to, it's going to develop flavor uh, even with a neutral yeast. Um, that being said, um, some of your English strains work very nicely for Russian, for Russian Imperial Stout, um, like the Lalam and the ESB yeast or the, um, the Nottingham yeast. Um, so Windsor is another good one from Lalleman for, for English beers. Um, and those tend to throw, uh, you know, s some more interesting esters um, and create a little maltier profile um, that you know, works very well in a, in a Russian Imperial Stout. Um, what you don't want to do, though, you don't want to underpitch. Um, and you don't want to under attenuate. There's nothing worse than a Russian Imperial Stout that is under attenuated because it's, it's too sweet to be able to finish the pint. Um, all of these big beers need to be well attenuated uh, to be drinkable. Yeah. We are going to have the last last questions because uh, okay. we are on time. So, um, if you don't have a, a California ale, for example, uh, you, do you recommend any other cheese to make lager? Um, yeah, the O5, you know, is 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 good. It's just. Watch that sulfur character. I think, again, yeah. high pitching rates, um, cool temperatures uh, will minimize that. Um, other, you know, other, the other yeasts I mentioned, like uh, Lalamond ESB yeast, um, you know, uh, the London type yeast uh, works very well as well. And uh, a mixed quick question. If you recommend, for example, the addition of fruit in boil on a boil or fermentation? Oh, um, for a fruit beer, it works best to uh, 
to add, ferment it separately, really. Um, this is from my friend Jamil. He says that they, if you pitch, um, if you ferment the fruit separately with the same yeast that you're using for the beer, um, it will ferment out cleanly and then you can combine the two beers after fermentation. And he says it gets better fruit character that way than say trying to ferment the beer first and then add add the fruit for a for a secondary fermentation. Um, that's the way I've done it in the past is I'll I'll make the beer first and then I'll add the fruit to the fermenter for a secondary fermentation. Um, and that works, but he but Jamil says that he gets better fruit character by fermenting the fruit separately using the same yeast strain, same, you know, conditions and everything, pitching rates. Uh, and then combining the two beers after fermentation. Awesome. Uh, and that's it. We okay. are really, really, really thankful for your presence here. It's awesome to have you in this uh, room. And uh, hopefully we expect to this, uh, I don't know, we, we have a second chance to talk about the uh, I don't know, water, that is a, an yeah. issue that uh, a lot of people ask for, but the uh, fermentation wins, so... Okay. And, uh, well, I'd be happy to, to do that. it again. Yeah, we can do it again awesome. some other time. Thank you very much, John. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Muchas gracias a todos, chicos, por la asistencia. Los invitamos a seguir las redes sociales de ACAS para que puedan tener eh, en un tiempo más esta grabación, tal como está comprometido. Y los invitamos también a eh, participar este martes de la segunda eh, entrevista que estaremos eh, haciendo. El invitado es Richard eh, Briganti, eh, de cervecería Longbeer de Brasil, la cual ganó el premio de la mejor cervecería de Sudamérica en eh, el South Beer Cup del año 2019. Con él estaremos hablando acerca de la historia eh, y todo lo referente a Catalina Sauer, el último estilo eh, de cerveza brasileño que actualmente está, está muy de moda por eh, todo el mundo. Uso de frutas, uso de especias, uso de hierbas eh, en una cerveza de trigo ácida. Así que lo esperamos el martes. Eh, sigan las redes sociales de ACAS y podrán eh, conocer el horario eh, en cada uno de sus países. Y el link de ingreso, eh, igual que hoy, se estará subiendo unos 10 a 15 minutos antes del inicio. También los invitamos para el día jueves, que estaremos con Diego Castro, desde Argentina, el cual está, eh, donde estaremos hablando acerca del servicio y los puntos más importantes para tocar en los bares cerveceros. Así que los esperamos tanto este martes como el próximo jueves. Eh, sigan las redes sociales de ACAS y van a poder también conocer lo que viene en la semana siguiente. Estaremos recabando eh, ideas sobre qué temas les gustaría a ustedes tocar eh, y seguiremos con invitados de alto nivel. Así que los invitamos, muchachos. Muchas gracias eh, por asistir el día de hoy y los invitamos a seguirnos. Chicos, súper importante, eh, por favor, traten de participar en las redes para poder tener las preguntas antes, lo cual hace que sea más fácil y más dinámico todo esto. Si tenemos una base mejor armada y eh, es más rápido y más interactivo, ¿ya? Para que lo tengan en consideración. Muchas gracias a todos, nos estamos viendo. Chao, chao.